communication is a weaponizer for climate action. If I reduce my own emission with 20% and if I tell 10 people about how I did it and that it's actually something good, I save money and I live a better life and they will do it, it will create this wave of change and that is creating the exponential change. So, so everyone could, could be a wave creator uh, and that's very important to know. Everyone has the power to do something again against this crisis. Ingmar Rentshoek is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Ingmar is the CEO and founder of WeDon'tHaveTime.org, the world's largest social network for climate action. He's an official eco-warrior, according to The Sun, and Mark Zuckerbert, according to France TV2. Ingmar is a serial entrepreneur with a background from the financial industry. He's a member of Al Gore's Climate Reality and European Climate Policy Task Force. This is how I know Ingmar, is I was the country coordinator for Austria and Germany, and we we're on several calls together with Al Gore's uh, um, climate reality project for the European branch. And so we, at, at very first, kind of had a lot of conversations over the phone and, and dealt with uh, getting the movement going for Europe and, and specifically Ingmar for Europe and the whole European task force. And then we met live in Berlin at the, uh, Ingmar was a mentor for a group of tables at the uh, Climate Reality Training in Berlin. And we got to meet live and then we had the great opportunity <clears throat> to sit at a, a table organized uh, by Ingmar with a bunch of global shapers who were also at the training from uh, uh, Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. And then finally, he he's also has a sponsor or a partnership with the Berlin School of Sustainable Futures. And we try to help each other out to, because we don't have time to, to support each other in as much as possible over the years. Welcome to the show, Ingmar. So glad that you could come by and find the time to speak to us. Yeah, happy to be here. And uh, nice to talk to you again, Mark. I, I really want to get into a couple of things uh, right off the beginning. So we've just experienced, I mean, we've been experiencing for a long time with some crazy times, especially around the climate. Um, but we've just experienced this pandemic. We're still in Germany, just uh, Hamburg just went in even tighter lockdown. Um, vaccines are starting to roll out. But it's been a crazy time, not just with the pandemic, but with Black Lives Matters, inequality, inauguration, all sorts of unease and disruption with our social and governmental systems around the world and, and climate inaction, climate denialism, things like that are just uh, rampant. Uh, at the beginning of, of this lockdown where um, you had an event, uh, uh, I believe it was a climate action summit event or event uh, in Sweden in your studios and um, Matter of fact, there were some speakers coming from Germany and other parts of Europe, and they're like, oh, we're in lockdown, but I think I can get the train. I think we can make it. And, and they ended up coming, and, and it worked out. And you, you, you kept things rolling because you were already a virtual platform. You all already had your app. You were already doing a lot of things in a, in a much more effective, sustainable way to, to roll out communications and activism in a much, much more coordinated. So the question really is, and I think I know the answer, I think my listeners know the answers, but how have you weathered this crazy time where you're like, we've been doing this for a while, is it well prepared? Or did you also experience some, some crazy experiences during this time? Uh, it's been a very, very, what do I say, different experience. Um, we, uh, as you mentioned, we have been a digital platform from, from day one. Uh, in, in 2018, we actually hosted the world's first digital public global conference where we had this climate conference where no one was flying. Everyone was doing it through, through Zoom, actually. Uh, and it's crazy to, to remember that now because nowadays all conferences are digitally. Uh, 
so we had kind of two years uh, advantage of using digital media in order to reach many people and, and have a dialogue. Uh, so in that way, it was very, very strange that suddenly everyone, we didn't need to educate people in the tools they were picking up and, and started to learn them for themselves. Um, but in a way, it was really strange, even for us was, of course, uh, the society. I mean, uh, suddenly you have the whole society locking down. We couldn't, uh, couldn't have meeting with colleagues in the same uh, office, etc. Uh, but we, surprisingly, I think we adapted so fast. And uh, I was really worried because I, I don't have previously liked this idea to have all the team working from home. I, have, I, I was kind of conservative CEO in my previous career where I always thought that people work from home wasn't working hard enough. <laughs> but I was wrong. Uh, I would say I don't question any of my colleagues uh, if they work or not, regardless of who, whoever they are. They are, of course, working as hard as, as they would if we were having the same office. And in the way we have changed the organization and we not have time to adapt to all this, is actually that uh, we have many internal meetings. Every day we start a meeting with where the whole team are checking in, uh, telling each other how they are feeling in their private life, if they're in bad mood or a good mood, slept good or bad, etc. And we're talking about and sharing about what we're going to do today. Uh, and that has been something we have continued doing throughout the whole pandemic, still do. And it's a really strange because suddenly there's no difference between the team that worked in the office uh, or the team that worked from uh, from ex other location, other countries, etc. Uh, now we're we are a true global organization. Not just when we do the outreach, the conferences. We're also a global organization in order of how we work together. And I think this will change so much in the society. Um, I mean. The airlines, they have always had this argument that they are making the world smaller because people need to meet each other, people need to travel. But I will say, I have not seen IDs travel the world so fast as it's doing right now. Uh, because people meet wherever they are, doesn't matter, they can still connect if they are in, at least in the same time zone. So I think it has been a challenge even for us, but uh, for us, I will say we we have prepared uh, before and we, are, we have adapted really fast and I'm really glad to see that so many others now are adapting. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone the advantage of having digital meetings, uh, but of course, even, even I am looking forward to meet people in, in in physical award. I mean, I met you in Berlin. I, take, I took the train. That's a climate friendly way to travel. And I think we're going to do that. Uh, but we're not going to do this fly in, talk 15 minutes, fly back. We're going to do more quality time when we travel. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But I think we will change the way we do business travel for good here. One last thing around around this topic of how have you weathered um, this crazy time? You've been doing this for a long time. Like you know, we've been together on Al Gore's climate reality, and and you were you were kind of doing this in a different method for for a long time. Did any of that give you resilience or kind of a, a better business model or operating system? that when something like this comes or other climate issues come um, that you, uh, you say, oh, I'm okay because I've already been working on this better model for life and I've weathered this, this storm a little bit better. Can you tell me a little bit about that or, or, yeah. or how it's been? I will say definitely. Uh, I mean, I think many, many people now have adapted to the Corona situation, but it took time. Uh, in the beginning of uh, 2020, there was so much confusing and, and, and everyone was canceling everything. All conferences were, were canceled. The COP26 meeting was postponed for a year. I mean, we have 10 years to act and suddenly you postponed the most important meeting for one year. And I got so annoyed at this. So what we did instead was that we were leveling up our big Earth Day conference. We actually helped Earth Day Network to, to host the 50th anniversary for the whole Earth Day. 
Uh, and suddenly we had this access to all leaders because everyone was sitting at home and, they, and everyone had cancelled their participants at other conferences. Uh, so we were really like a lonely, active uh, lighthouse where we, where we actually kept the conversation about the climate going. And I, I think we played a role here showing the world that we can't cancel. If the world changes, we must adapt and we must continue no matter what, because we, we can't wait. I mean, we know that it's going to happen so many more crazy things in the future. This pandemic is, is just a bump on the road, basically, because in a hotter world, we will see more pandemics. We will see a lot of more disturbance happening. So we must be resilient. And the best way to be resilient is to adapt. But... Um, it could hurt to adapt too fast, of course, because we humans, we were not, we are really good at adapting, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging to adapt very, very fast. But I would also say that I'm really impressed about how the whole society has adapted. And that gives me hope that we, we, can, we can actually solve the climate crisis if we act, because what we have seen here is so much change in a fast, time period many many people thought were impossible it's suddenly now very much impossible uh, and i think the reason why we have actually succeeded in changing so in in and adapting to the corona situation is that people know about the problem Pe people are aware about they need to act themselves they need to show responsibility uh, and they know about the problem and they know about the solutions and they are involved in, in helping each other to, to get through this time of a pandemic. Uh, so that is what we need to do now with the climate. We need people involved. We can't just have the global elite talking about the climate crisis. We need everyone on deck. And, yeah, for, no. that, and then for that to happen, we need to educate, educate people and we need to inform people and we need to do that every single day uh, constantly. I agree. And I mean, not only in, in the name of your organization, we don't have time as the urgency there, but in everything you do, the apps, the tools, the uh, empowerment that you give each individual to become active, kind of pick them up at the location that they are at and, and, and a level of learning or level of activism or level of business, whatever it is that from that point, they can start and do something. And there's tools there. I really like that. This year, I, I, I see and I, I can tell from what you said, uh, uh, some fabulous things and a lot of learnings out of there, but also preparedness because you've been in this mindset before. But there was things like the, the, the TED countdown event that you played a part in and, and uh, not only, I think, partnership or sponsor, but you had your uh, uh, kind of a talk there with, it, with your regular moderator. Um, then you have held the Exponential Climate Action Summit in September 2020, which is, is uh, fabulous. That term exponential gets thrown around a lot, but I, I, I believe what, you, what you're doing is educating people to understand the exponential function for those of us who uh, didn't realize that the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 grew exponentially, and that's one, one kind of example of the exponential function and how quickly it can happen and affect us all over the world, but also how a tiny little thing, I mean, the coronavirus is tinier than, than a grain of sand or a particle of dust or a hair follicle. Um, it's, it's very small, but has a huge ripple effect. Yeah. And, and the climate crisis and biodiversity and extinction are even much bigger than that. So I love that you had that and you've had some fabulous people. So you've uh, um, Bertrand Picard, Johan Rockstrom, uh, Christiana Figueres and numerous others that now, I, I don't know if it was because they were locked down or they just say, we don't have time, we need to do this exponential and they came on board. Um, do you think that because of the pandemic, now it was easier to, to bring such rock stars for the climate on board to speak with you? Or how did you see that, that all occurring? And what is your message even around exponential? Um, of course, it's easier to get, I, I don't know. I mean, before the corona, we were the only ones doing digital meetings. And people love that concept. High level people love that concept because they, they didn't need to travel. 
to 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 reach out with their message. Uh, so many of the high level people you were mentioning now is actually people we have invited and had had on our stages long before Corona. But of course, more people are available uh, because they're not traveling around the world. So they have time to do stuff like this. But now we're living in this um, uh, this era of uh, like inflation of, of digital meetings and Zoom calls, etc. And I think I think it's a lot of people have grown tired tired of watching online conferences. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think I think we are going to continue doing our global conferences, but we are also in a process where we're developing this concept. And where we're heading in now is making those global events being more more of a dialogue where you can have the high level people, but you also have the anyone on stage that can ask questions and, and be involved in, in 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 a much in a much more concrete way where you have a two way communication. And and what we have what we have seen here quite recently is the success of the new social network clubhouse. And uh, we, we started uh, that is social network for, for people that likes to talk. So it's a social network where people are talking, not, not writing. Uh, and that's, I mean, they are growing in, insane. Uh, and we actually started the Climate Crisis Club on, uh, on Clubhouse. And in just a couple of weeks, we, we reached over 10,000 members. So there's a great need of um, having a dialogue, not just listen but talk to the leaders uh, where, uh, and, and the leaders also wants to talk with the people I, I think we we need to go from blaming each other and uh, want someone else to do something uh, we need to do it ourselves but we also need to do it together with the ones that have the power and if they don't do it instead of instead of complaining I think it's uh, many times it could be more efficient to uh, offer some help. Do you need some help in your process of going fossil free? Uh, that is much more uh, friendly approach to get people change their minds, I will say. So with, you know, the, obviously our world is growing good, bad and ugly around us exponentially, but there is the flip side of that coin that most people don't understand that the exponential function as in your exponential climate uh, action summit can also be used for the positive. And so a lot of people are like, uh, see the doom and gloom or yeah. give up. It's too big. It's too overwhelming. But that same function really yeah. uh, can be used to reach critical mass and go yeah. beyond critical mass to yeah. solve these problems. Uh, and this is a very important uh, thing. Uh, the exponential, many people have realized that exponential change could be very, very devastating. I mean, the virus are, are multiplying exponentially. Uh, biodiversity or animals are dying exponentially. Uh, we are deforestation or growing exponentially. Uh, you have so many problems that are developing in this multiplying exponential way. And, and more and more people have started to realize uh, how exponential mathematics works. But it is hard for people to understand it because it's not... It's, it's not you know, something we have intu intuition to understand. It's something we need to understand with our intellect. And my own background is that actually, I, before I started my career in finance, I, I was actually studying mathematics. So, so that's maybe a reason why I have a little bit better understanding of the exponential. And what you can do with exponential uh, functionality is actually applying to the solutions. And, and this is important because many people are so frustrated that we're moving too slowly <laughs> in order to solve the climate crisis. Uh, and, uh, and we are, of course. But the exponential function is important uh, to understand because that is applied also to the solutions. And uh, now we start to see what leaders, uh, we start to see corporate corporations, they are starting to make all those pledges. They are starting to make this action. It's not enough. I mean, we know that. But here is the thing. When they start doing things, they are the, in the beginning of that exponential curve. So we, need, we don't need them to be there. We just need to have them walk the exponential 
action curve. So therefore, it's super important, and that's why we at We Don't Have Time actually have built this into our system. It's super important to reward not just the perfect action, but all action. Because what you do today is something that is going to help you do more tomorrow. And yes, it's not enough if you see it as a linear, it's a, as a linear development. But if you see it as an exponential development, it will be enough. Uh, not enough if you don't, if you lose track of the exponential curve. So it's super important to reward everyone that are doing climate action in the beginning of the, of the exponential curve. But we also need to get them following that exponential curve so that they don't get off track and, and be lazy and going linear change. Uh, so we need to reward all good action, but we also need to pressure them to do more so that they are adapting to the exponential change curve. Uh, and therefore, it could be really counterproductive uh, when the climate movement sometimes are too negative. Because if you're too negative, uh, you will get people off the exponential curve and just stand by the side and do nothing. And that will not help us. So we need to have them, we need to reward all good action and we need to keep the pressure up so that they will do exponential good action. When they have done something good, tomorrow they need to do a double good. And, and there you go. I, t I totally agree. And, and I'm, I thank you for explaining that. And I mean, there's much more you can you can go or I could go into that, but it's really, uh, um, you know, when we as human beings, homo sapiens are presented with a, a, a gorilla or a tiger or a lion, we're like, oh, you know, get scared. We run, it's fight or flight mode. Yeah. But, but when we're presented with a graph or chart and say, you know, we're gonna have five degrees of warming by this time, or, if, or, or here's a graph that says, you know, temperatures have risen a lot of us don't know what to do with that because it no. doesn't feel as ex existential um and so the the fact that you're picking up everyone where they're at where the point where they're at now in their lives and giving them the tools the education and the help to support to not feel like oh i'm too small i can't do anything but also to understand the numbers the facts the 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 truth behind the data and how it applies to them in their life and how they can, can apply the exponential function, the roadmap, and, that, and that's a, a lot of term and what they do to really reach critical mass, to reach beyond critical mass and do something. And so I love that. And thank you for, for going into that uh, with me. There is a question, I believe, I, I know the answer already, but I'd like to hear it from you and, and uh, your organization. Do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, divisions, borders, uh, uh, humanity one from another, kind of distancing each other one from another. And the reason I mentioned that question, I'll kind of give you the caveat or the journey I'm trying to take you on is during this, this time of lockdown, I mean, Sweden was pretty good up until recently, uh, not doing many lockdowns, but most, most of us have, have had lockdowns uh, and, and from what my understanding is, the reason Sweden didn't do it is because they didn't have laws to do that even. And, and now that they do have those and, and, and some things are, are changing, but it, it worked out pretty good regardless. But now during this time, food was a global citizen, continued to travel across borders, species, air, water, continued to, to travel across borders and nations. And um, those were all global citizens um, in, in many respects, but, but we weren't. We were distanced from one another. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts and feelings and how, how you feel about that. And would that have any solutions um, towards a better future, towards the futures you're working on? Um, I mean, I see myself absolutely as an individual living on one planet, not a planet divided into different kind of sectors. Uh, so absolutely, uh, I mean, it's very important that we, we, uh, we have, it's just random where you're, where you're born. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a meaning that you have been born on this planet. Uh, so wherever you are, I think we need to see this as, it's a global problem and the only way to solve it is as seeing you as a global 
part of a global solution. Uh, so I, I definitely think that, uh, I mean, with the technology we're now using, I, sometimes I don't even know the nationality of the people I, I, I talk to. It doesn't matter because what's matter is that the values you have is much more important than, than you happen to be born or where your citizenship are, etc. But I will also say that I think I think national national identity of the place we are born is also something that are deeply rotten, deeply uh, meaningful for for humans. So I, I feel a prolonging to my my area in Sweden. I'm I'm raised in northern Sweden. It's really beautiful nature uh, in the middle of Sweden. It's like one people every square mile or something like that. So really not too dense uh, and I see myself uh, patriotic for that region, absolutely. I also see myself as a Swedish uh, and I'm proud of when Sweden doing something good and I'm not so proud if we're doing not so good. Uh, I, I don't think you need to choose basically, every one of us are global citizens, but we also need to, to stay in the local community and uh, care for, for our neighbors. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should give a shit about the people that don't live nearby. We need to, I think we can do, I think we, I, I see myself as a global citizen and a local citizen, and I don't see any, any colliding interest or conflict there. Uh, but we are, I mean, we will not solve the climate crisis if we are uh, making war with each other and, and, and all, only think of our own nationality. That is, uh, I, I, we, I, I, that's no way forward, uh, and I think more and more people are realizing that. What's also great with the global citizen mentality is that uh, it's really easy to reach a critical mass of people willing to change because you don't need to, you can reach them all over the world and suddenly there are millions of them. And what the, the aim of We on the Time platform is, is to connect everyone uh, with each other that wants to solve the climate crisis, no matter where in the world they are. Uh, and I'm really proud that we today have members in over 140 countries uh, working together. And, and uh, of course, we, we need to be global. Uh, but I also think we, we, need to, we shouldn't be ashamed of feeling proud of where we live. Uh, so, so I would say both. Yeah, you, you definitely got the answer right. There is no right or wrong answer for sure. And I, that, that's correct. There's, there's this thinking, um, uh, and this is kind of why I bring it up, that, that, that we don't understand that there's both and that we, don't, that we also are kind of worried that we're going to lose our culture or identity of where we're born. Think that, you know, there's a lot of fear around that. But the, the biggest fear uh, for me or concern would be, um, you know, we, we're living in Europe. But there are decisions made in the United States uh, yeah. regarding whether you be in the Climate Paris Agreement or not. There's yeah. a, and, and Brazil with Bolsonaro letting the Amazon rainforest burn. That has not only political decisions, but far-reaching environmental decisions that touch us all here on this world. And so um, if we don't have some kind of a, a voice or, or something that we can do on a global level to say, hey, it's not right that the Amazon rainforest yeah. is burning or you're dumping plastics in the ocean or whatever it may be, um, then it's almost a feeling of helplessness or feeling yeah. like, yeah, we, we stay but, in your country, don't worry about it. And so no, I no, think we, I mean, that, yeah. that's, um, we can't have that mentality. And in the way, it is also, it, 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 the world doesn't work that way. Uh, Brasilia president has actually answered a climate warning on the We Not a Time platform because many people started to stop trading from, from the country and, and money talks. So we are interlinked uh, with each other and uh, the economic system is truly global and, and we can't act on a global problem only local. We need to take a global responsibility. Uh, and uh, actually, I will say that we have, we, we who lives in a free world where we could actually express your opinions and, and, uh, and mobilize people regarding the environment, etc. Uh, we have a so huge responsibility to use that freedom to also be the voice for all the people in the world that don't have the freedom. So uh, if, we, if you're lucky to be born in a free country, 
uh, you also have a responsibility to to actually care for the ones that are not born in a free country if you want to solve the climate crisis it's important for us that have that voice that we also are talking for for them because they can't do it they may be risking their lives and just uh, speaking up and, uh, and that's not fair so so what i would say is that uh, all the people that are born in a free society uh, freedom is great but with freedom comes responsibility and responsibility is something we have forgotten about in this society and I'm so frustrated of all those leaders. They are everywhere. In Sweden, we have those uh, government people that are talking about you should you should not go and and and, and shop from from malls in the pandemic. You should stay home. Only only buy from from internet. Uh, you should wear a face mask mask when you when you travel by train, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they don't do it themselves. Our prime minister were, were walking in stores the day before Christmas buying presents for his wife. I mean, and, and on the question, I don't know how to, to buy from, from internet, but everyone else is supposed to do it. He's encouraging everyone to do something he's not ready to do himself. And that, that's not just, it's not him. He's just part of this uh, leadership without responsibility. We have this code in Texas. And, and the governor were like traveling to a sunny destination and, and like yeah. fleeing the field. We had the forest fires in Australia and the prime minister were traveling to Hawaii enjoying the sun when the whole country was burning. This is absurd. We can't have this kind of leadership. And, and, and this is what we have regarding the climate and so many other issues. We must make responsibility something uh, that people want to have. And the only way to do it is if we, our leaders need to show more responsibility, I think. I, and everyone. I, I totally agree. The, um, uh, there, there's not only with this leadership showing the responsibility, but with leadership comes a lot of stewardship. You're yeah. steward not only over your country and, and uh, ec uh, ecology of the area you're, you're representative, but for the human beings there as well. There was a, um, a beautiful thing that came out just a couple of days ago from the mayor of New Jersey, where he gave a thing. He, he was uh, at uh, uh, a building fire at an apartment building, the basement, a couple levels of the basement burned. And he was just kind of, and really, it was, I think there was maybe a couple apartments and a couple of people displaced, but he was there on the scene, did a TV report, says, you know, use carbon monoxide detectors, use smoke detectors. He was given that information. He gave his telephone number, said, if you don't have those, give us a call, give me a call on my number anytime. We'll get somebody out to, to, to install one for free for you because we want you to be safe. We want you to have heating uh, during this cold time. And those are the type of leaders that we really need to see in our world that truly care about one another as human beings instead yeah. of their own agendas and the, the lobbyists that are feeding their pockets. And then, you know, my, my, my te Texas is a prime example with Ted Cruz. His people are suffering. People are without basic needs. And, and he just takes off because, and, and so, excuse my friends, he just doesn't give a shit. And, 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 and um, that there's nothing worse that really uh, is upsetting because it, we're all on the same planet. We're all distant cousins, even though Ted Cruz is a total ass, he's still a distant cousin of mine and, and he should be concerned about me as, as I am of him on making sure our planet functions right. And we just have this disparity of leadership that don't under, understand their stewardship and responsibility. Yeah. I, I think one reason why it is this way is that uh, the political leaders and also corporate leaders uh, they need they are only getting the criticism uh, and in, in order to survive in us in a in a field where you're criticized when you're doing something wrong you need to be very very mentally strong <laughs> And, and, and sometimes you just don't, you need to distance yourself from, from the people because they are always giving you so much criticism. Media is calling you out. And it's really, and if on social media, people are really, really 
I'm polite and telling you a lot of shit. Uh, and I think that that creates more unresponsible leaders. Not it's not it doesn't create responsible leaders. It, it will be working the other way. All the people that are uh, or, or have high emotional intelligence, they will avoid the leadership because they, they don't want to be in that spot. So, so what is important here is to criticize leaders when they don't do the right thing. But we also need, again, reward them that are doing the right thing. The example you now talked about, I never heard about it. Uh, it just came a couple of days yeah. ago, but I'll but, send but you the link. The Ted Cruz example is the one you'd read about in media. The good example, you don't hear of it. The, yeah, the, hardly it ever. is not covering that story as much as the bad example. But there are as much good example as bad example as there. We just need to cover the good example as much as the bad example. So that's why we at We Don't Have Time, we have this system where we have climate love for the great action and climate warning for the bad action. And what's giving me so much comfort is that on our platform, 70% are actually about climate love and only 30% are members creating climate uh, warning. So it's a great need of rewarding good action and we should not forget that. But sometimes I'm also getting so mad at those unresponsible leaders. So of course we need to criticize this when that is happening. One example, I, I must say this, it, in the climate field, it's now really great as the billionaires are awakening. They are doing a lot of communication about how they want to be part of the solution. You have everything from Elon Musk uh, having this carbon capturing price of 100 million US dollars. That's great. That's, that's absolutely something we need to reward. Uh, absolutely. But it's kind of absurd that the same week Elon Musk is doing that price, his firm is investing billions in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is, a, is the cryptocurrency that are emitting the most carbon. It's actually Bitcoin are emitting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere compared to Denmark, the, the country. So Bitcoin is not a green solution. So this is very dissonance. Uh, and I know that Elon Musk has this knowledge. So I'm really annoyed at how he could talk about and do good things and at the same time just don't give a shit and do the right opposite just to earn some more money. Uh, you have Bill Gates. He has newly released this very good book about the climate. I've got it right here too. Uh, and the same week, I think, his investment company are investing billions of dollars in a private jet company. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's something wrong with that behavior. Uh, and, and, and we should not criticize Bill Gates or Elon Musk for everything they do. We should reward them for the good action, but we, we must call them out for, for the bad action and have them to stop the bad and only do the good. It, it, we don't have time for this doing good, doing bad, getting us nowhere. And because they don't understand that maybe they are doing more good than bad themselves. I think they motivate their action by that they're doing more good than bad. But they don't understand that what the most important role they have in the world, regards to global citizenship, are that they are leaders that people looking up to and follow. And if the leaders don't do their own advice, live as they preach, no one else will. No one else will. And they will, will end up being a much bigger part of the problem instead. Uh, so, so this is what we try to achieve with the We Not Have Time platform, is to achieve a scorecard where everyone, not, not the elite or the expert, everyone, you and me and, and all of us, regardless if you live in Africa or in Australia or in Europe, um, we could give encouraging, rewarding climate love when our leaders are doing something good, and we could Give call them out when they do something bad and have them to change. Exactly, yeah, I've got it right here on my phone. Uh, we don't have time app, and I mean, it's absolutely. It was actually the next question I was going to ask you. You you've actually created fabulous solution um, to, uh, and it's almost a form, in my opinion. I see it similar to 
to Taiwan in an upvoting process. It's not so much being the no. negative or saying the mean stuff. It's what what are the climate things that we can fix or the problems that we can fix, and we do it kind of through an upvoting or raising enough critical mass to, to to let those leaders know they need a change. There's a lot of people concerned about that, but uh, but uh, upvoting the positive actions which is another way to use the exponential yeah. function in, in the uh, right way. And, and when, when it's criticism, it's not about just shame the one. What we like, actually want to do uh, in regard to what I mentioned, like the example with the Bill Gates uh, private jet investment, I would like him to explain what, 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 why he did that investment. And, and maybe he has a master plan to make it electric private jet flight. I don't know, maybe that is true. So, so it's all about having the leaders explaining themselves. Uh, maybe Elon Musk has a great green plan for Bitcoin. I doubt it, but he may be, or maybe he doesn't be aware about, about how, how big em, emitting the cryptocurrency actually are. Uh, so our platform is all about the dialogue. Uh, so upvote is important, but when you have criticism, Instead of just telling someone that you're an idiot, listen to them uh, and have a dialogue. And, and who, for the, because just tell them that they are idiots will have them to do more bad things. That's yeah. how we work. We, we make enemies and we don't listen to enemies. We just ignore them and we be annoyed. So, so the dialogue thing is super important. And, and it goes in two ways. Our leaders also need to listen to the, to the stakeholders and, and to the people. Um, and we can't just have this election every every fourth year. So we need to have the election going on all day long, uh, everywhere. Uh, and um, that creates a lot of change, I would say. Have you uh, read this book, the, the New Climate War by Michael Mann, by chance? No, I haven't read it, but I have it on my uh, to-do list. <laughs> have you heard at all about him or read any of his other books? Uh, actually not, but I'm I'm a bit, I'm I'm following him closely on, on Twitter. Yeah, so he I, does uh, a lot about climate denial. He's pretty uh, yeah. boisterous in his voice, uh, but this leads nicely to the next question that I want to ask you. So, um, there's a lot of you know big corporations or uh, bad leaders who try to engage climate activists in an argument with each other. So like they take the, the vegan movement yeah. around food and climate and yeah. they say, well, you know, they pit those people against the, yeah. the climate activists yeah, yeah. Who, who maybe aren't vegan, who yeah. are concerned about the environment. And, and then they've got us fighting against each other and we're not yeah. going anywhere. We're fighting against yeah. each other because of whatever. How do you feel about that? Or what are some examples and how we can avoid that? Or, or, or uh, give me your thoughts and feelings about that. Uh, that's absolutely true. And unfortunately, uh, the space of nonprofit organization that is, that is most of the environment organization out there are nonprofit. They, are, they don't need people to make that happen, sometimes they are really good at making it happen themselves. Because there's a problem that we need to address. Uh, I love nonprofit organization. We don't have time. Are not a nonprofit organization. We are a for-profit company with a nonprofit main owner, but we are a for-profit company. And that is, I believe that in order to solve the climate crisis, we must make it the biggest business opportunity on earth, so that everyone works on this, not the ones, just the ones that are working with someone else money uh, a problem with non-profit is that they they need to in order to, for them to have more donations they need to market their name so all their action needs to be in their own name so that's why it's really hard for non-profits to cooperate with other non-profits but because they are competing with the donations uh, so here is, uh, I think we need a different mentality and we need different systems and we are going to see that so many places now that we are not the only company working for climate, it's many, many companies out there and non-profits are also learning on how they can work closely together. So what I see here is that the climate movement as whole is slowly, but it's picking up pace, starting to learn to work together. And, and the mission behind We Don't Have Time is that we want to accelerate that. 
our mission is to connect everyone and have everyone cooperate, no matter if you're an organization or an individual. So everyone is warmly welcome to use our platform and talk with others with the help of the network we're creating. We, we don't want to take credit for it. We just want it to happen because it needs to happen. Uh, so what is happening is that this scares the hell out of the enemy. Uh, the, the fossil fuel interest, uh, because the reason why they have been successful in delaying all the change in the world is that they, they have sometimes fueled this um, internal uh, fight between different kind of environment organization, but often they just need to, to stand by and see it happen by itself. <laughs> what they see now is a moment picking up ground where we have a much, much higher toler to tolerance for different opinions within the climate movement. Uh, you could be pro-nuclear and work together with someone that are against nuclear, but both people want to solve the climate crisis and they really don't like the fossil fuel interest. Uh, that is what we have built our platform to, to help. And that is what we are seeing now is happening in so many places. This scares the hell out of the enemy. And uh, we have experienced this uh, firsthand because uh, not everyone likes what we do. Uh, so we have actually had, had a lot of problem with uh, everything from having our office tapped to having our YouTube broadcast shut down to, uh, to uh, having our mail accounts hacked and, uh, and also a lot of other strange things happening. Uh, that is really crazy. That could make anyone a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that um, uh, the strategy of having the climate movement turn into the turn to each other has been very successful. But it's a dead end because now we're gaining momentum where that is not going to stop us. Uh, and I also see that. Um, I mean, the interest working against the climate movement, they now starting to see more and more that it's more profitable to join compared to fight against it. Uh, and this is something good. This is how we turn the enemy to our allies. I mean, my dream is to have the big oil companies doing everything they can in order to capture carbon on this planet. But here is something strange. Many people don't want that because many people will not forgive them because what they did yesterday. But if we're going to make it, we can't make enemies of people because what they have been, did in the past. We need to move on and only focus on the future action. I, I totally agree that you've just opened up several big discussions. So the, the Limits to Growth book is called the Climate Science Bible, written in 1972. Yeah, um, by we, had, we had the, the water on our first yeah, exactly. climate conference. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was the Club of Rome and the Volkswagen Foundation or Stiftung in German. Um, but we all know, you know, Dieselgate 2015 Volkswagen, they must not have read their own climate uh, uh, <laughs> science Bible, but companies make mistakes. People make mistakes. Yeah. We can learn, we can recover, we can change. We, uh, and moving forward I, I, on, on the flip side of that, uh, Moya is a sub company of Volkswagen doing uh, wonderful things on electric mobility and, and making that transition a lot of positive things are happening. A lot more could happen. Uh, it could be always be a little bit better. But uh, you, you know, I, I've made mistakes. Al Gore's made mistakes. Yeah. We all have. Yeah, we, 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 please give us the chance to bounce back and make it right to 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 leave the planet better than we found it. That that's one area. The other one that I really want to go into is is you know we're where we were pit and many times by bigger organizations, by bigger movie movements and lobbyists who were actually from the chemical companies, from the fossil fuel industry, posting articles, the Koch brothers or, or yep. uh, the Murdoch group, whoever it is, um, trying to get us to kind of fight against each other yep. or turn us into climate deniers or climate inaction. 
And I think we've wised up. We've figured out that there's some education, some tools and how we can see through that smoke and mirrors, especially with what has happened during this time. And like you so eloquently said it, you, you're providing some of the tools, some of the education, some of the talks and summits and uh, along with the UN and other things that are really helping to, to make that shift. And, and um, I, nothing bad for you, but there could be 100,000 we don't have time organizations and then we would start to make a real big dent. And you're setting the example for the world, so to say, that we're starting, we're, here's our example, this is what needs to happen. Now let's get one for, uh, on the equivalent of, of uh, uh, WeChat in China and on the equivalent of this so that everybody in the world, every language, every culture has access to these tools to make that movement. Um, because I think we're just, as far as population goes, I think we're just tickling the surface, just getting going on where we need to be. But I'd like to know your thoughts on that, if you don't mind. Um, you covered a lot, but but uh, one one thing I think is interesting to to mention is that we, we talked about this global citizen and and the, and the national citizen. Uh, I think we could also talk about the corporate citizen and the society citizen uh, and many people they forget that when they when they are talking about a company as their enemy they're talking about thousands of people that are really different <laughs> working at that company uh, and, and 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 if you have a bad leader in the world like a dictatorship what they always want to do is to create the enemy outside the organization so that they can control the organization and have them do all all the evil stuff that they want to do as a bad leader uh, in order to 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 make that not going to happen is to break break the organization and, and get the individual responsibility out of the organization and this is something i see that is in in, in the younger generation when they work at a chemical company if they even want to work there at all they don't see themselves as loyal soldiers for that company. No, they see them as some someone working within that company that has a global or a society responsibility. And um, therefore, it's going to be much harder to do bad things. And, and in order to speed this up, we need to give all those people within in those organizations that are maybe not doing the good thing giving them the voice and the platform to help them create change within. And in order to do that, we can't portray the whole organization as an enemy. We need to, oh, here's something in, in, a, in an organization that actually are doing something great. Great, let's work with this person and, and, and help him get her voice uh, amplified and, and notice, et cetera. Uh, and, and the management can't ignore it. So, so again, we need everyone to take responsibility. They can't hide in front of their employer. Like, I can't do anything about this. This is my company, my employer's responsibility. We, we, we can't have going on. We need to, everyone to take the responsibility. And what we're going to do on We Not A Time is actually something that we're going to help, help getting this um, going in a much better way. And that is uh, making, we're going to publish the carbon footprint for all companies that uh, that have has has this information available it's a thousand of companies that actually have calculated their their emission and they published this in the report but it's really hard to translate that data into what that means for you so what we are going to do on the wheel on the time platform is to display that data uh, and divide it with uh, the number of employees an organization have so that when you work for a big corporation, you maybe have five ton emission because you're going to work. So it's your responsibility to talk to your boss in order to have your boss help you reduce that five ton to four ton because the competitor maybe only have three ton. Uh, so this will make the organization really nervous if they have a huge emission per, to per ton per employee. Uh, because th that will have them to struggle to motivate why they are bad, not performing as well as their 
uh, another company within the same business sector, etc. And this is breaking up this responsibility. If you work in a factory, even if you work on the floor, you're responsible to raise your voice and, and have the, the corporation just has, you're working for to change. I totally agree. And, and, and that is a beautiful thing. That, that leads so nicely into this next type of a, a question. So you come from the financial industry and have done investments in the past and and uh, have probably seen this, I hope, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have, where when you do, you invest in sustainable index funds or even, even if there wasn't any sustainable ones at the time, that we're moving in the right direction as far as corporate social responsibility or ethical uh, investments. Um, th this has totally been put on its head uh, and it really hit the moment in 2020. So before that, we were seeing traction and movement. We saw some statements at, at uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos from BlackRock and, and many others about th this is pretty much becoming a requirement but last year, 2020, we saw in all four quarters, first, second, third, and fourth quarter, that sustainable index funds, ESG investing and business uh, um, models all outperformed their conventional counterparts. Uh, eight out of 10 in, in the first and second quarter, nine out of 10 in the second, uh, uh, third and fourth quarters. And on the Morning Star Review, it started out, I think, 25 out of 28 on the Morning Star Review. Uh, uh, sustainable in indexes outperformed their conventional counterparts. And at the end, it was something like 27 out of 28. And we're talking Nikkei, Na NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. We're talking global S&P, global 500, all these that just totally continued during the worst economic time, pandemic and everything, just continue to do. It's a better business model. It's a better operating. You said it so eloquently. And matter of fact, it's funny because you have me speak for we don't have time, just a little sound bite type of an interlude break. And that's exactly what I spoke about as um, the world's biggest problems, the greatest problems around human suffering and climate change are the world's biggest opportunities to not only to do the right thing, yeah. but to, to an opportunity to 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 to. I hate to say profits, but to make sustainable investments that give a good return, long-term return. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, something very hopeful that, that you see this development. Uh, but uh, I, but I, I think we're not there yet. We need to do so much more, but this is a good start, uh, I will say. But it's still often very much more profitable to do the wrong thing. <laughs> and much more expensive to do the right thing. Uh, because if, if you, for instance, if you're going to build a house, uh, you, could, you could either build it with the cement that we have, it's cheap and it emits a lot of emissions. It's about, I think it's uh, cement alone is like 4% of all global emissions or something like that. Or you could buy the more new state-of-the-art technology uh, that are green cement. And actually you have cement out there uh, that will uh, have a negative carbon footprint, that will capture more carbon from there in the building's lifetime when it's, uh, when it's emitting when you manufacture it. But it's super expensive today. So what are companies doing? They are using the old cement because they can't make profit of, uh, of doing the, the new technology that today are too expensive. Uh, and, and there we go, we're not solving the crisis. So we, what we need desperately to achieve in a short time period is making it very, very expensive to do the wrong choice and very, very profitable to do the right choice. And here you can work in two areas. You can work in the economic area by uh, introducing carbon tax, by introducing um, emission rights trading, et cetera, et cetera. That needs that our board leaders are having a lot of talks and, and it's often just running out of being a lot of talks. And when you have something moving in this field, you have too low, so it will not have the, the, uh, the contribution to the climate solution that you want. Uh, so that area is something that is you could use, but it's very, very hard to, to make that happen. Instead, you could use the communication weapon. Uh, and that is much, much faster to apply. And that is what we are, we know, a timer building. We are building a rating platform 
we are, that we're going to launch this year, where you can look up all companies in the world and you can compare them of who is doing good climate action and who is doing bad climate action. Uh, and that will make it profitable. You will be rewarded with communication if your company is actually doing the good climate action. And you will get disqualified if you're doing the wrong choices. So this green uh, building company that are choosing the expensive cement are getting credit for it. And if they are getting communication credit for it, they will sell more apartments. They will sell, uh, they can take a higher price for the product because the population, the citizen, the consumer, us, knows that they're doing something and we're willing to pay more. And there you go, that will catalyze change. Uh, so communication is also economics. And this is often forgotten. And you don't need to be a United Nation in order to change how you communicate in the world. You not just need to be uh, a group of people using technology in order to, to make it happen. There, there was something interesting you said, uh, because I follow you, we're, we're, uh, we're connected uh, as well, but you said it uh, uh, around New Year's at the time of a New Year's resolution. And I understood it perfectly, but I was wondering, I was hoping you could repeat it for, for our listeners who didn't get to see the beautiful post. You said, I'm going to stop smoking. Well, first of all, you don't smoke, but uh, I, I would love you to give us that analogy um, yeah. because I think it's very fitting on where we need to be and how we need to change this paradigm of thinking. No, it, it actually, the frustration out of this, uh, you, you, you have all those global leaders uh, that are, uh, are also big, large corporations that are telling people that uh, in the year 2050, we will, we will go net zero. And again, I don't think we should criticize them for, for telling that, but we should talk about how they should succeed in, 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 in making that happen here and now. So I make an analogy where I promised everyone that in the year 2050, I will go smoke free. Uh, and I also did this really frustrating because you have a lot of strange things. How do you calculate the progress? Uh, you now see a lot of countries uh, proclaiming their net zero targets and it's like kind of a competition between countries china 2060 european like 2030 or you have a, a lot of dates but what is strange with all those dates is that many countries are, have different base level days some are comparing emission uh, like we should reduce the emission with 50 percent compared to 2005 levels uh, and someone else is saying that we should reduce our emission with 55 percent compared to 1990 levels. Uh, and this is really frustrating because people are like cheating. In, instead of comparing data with data, they are kind of building a smoke screen and, and finding loopholes how, how they could have those targets look better than they actually are. So, so that is what I criticize because I also told that I, I will, uh, in 10 years, I will smoke half as much cigarettes as I did when I was a chain smoker 10 years ago. Uh, so, so it was kind of an analog of that. It, it's crazy. Yeah. What's important, of course, we need to have a vision. Like in the future, we should go 100% net zero. Uh, that, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but that should not be something we should brag about. What we should brag about is what we're doing here and now this year and how it went, because that's how we can follow the progress. And it's much more important what you do in the beginning of the exponential curve than you do in the, in the end. The end will, you will succeed with the end if you do the right thing in the beginning. Uh, so instead of focusing on criticizing all those net zero targets, let them have that. <laughs> I mean, most people will not be alive. Uh, that are deciding those targets today uh, yeah. anyway. Let them have that game of uh, doing a lot of uh, pledges in the future. Let's in, uh, but instead, we should focus on what they're doing here and now, and we should help them to succeed of doing more here and now. The, the one thing that I kind of, I, I say something very similar. So what, what do those targets of, you know, we're going to go neutral, carbon neutral by 2050, or we're going to reduce our emissions by this, by that time. I often say, you know, um, basically they're telling us they're, they're still doing wrong. They're just going slower in the wrong direction. 
which is if you know any, because you know math and you because you, you know how the exponential function works it's basically saying we're going on the wrong in the wrong direction on the freeway but we've slowed down our speed we're doing less harm and and, and that type of thinking is is very incremental and can never be exponential can yeah. never get us where we are and that's why exactly like you said this now really plays an important part because it's those small um, steps that uh, we continue to take that are exponential steps of, of change now that eventually it becomes easier and easier. And that exponential is, is almost an automated uh, growth yeah. of success and, and achieving those that uh, humans have a hard time to comprehend. So, and, and that's really, uh, but, go ahead. But I also think we need this uh, target in the future when we have this, we need to be 100% fossil free before 24 or 25. Absolutely. But what I think is that it's not something for individual corporation or individual uh, companies to do those pledges. That would be, I think that would be the role for the world government or the Paris Agreement to set that date. Uh, after the year, I don't know, 2040, we will not use any more fossil fuel. That is what we need to do. And, and, and we could have all those companies and governments figure out their way of reaching that target. But the target should be something that we have a global governments uh, behind. And if we can't get every country in the world agreeing on that target in the Paris Agreement, let's build a coalition of willing countries and uh, maybe also invite the corporations to actually set an end date of fossil fuel use. Uh, that's the only way we're going to solve this crisis. We can't like having all those soft targets uh, in, uh, proclaimed uh, without any accountability behind. We need a global leadership there. But if we don't have the global leadership, don't I mean that will happen in the exponential curve of change sooner or later. Instead, we should focus on what we can do here and now. And uh, if we can't make the world governance to make set that target, let us focus on what we can do here and now. Everyone could reduce their own carbon emissions. Uh, you could start at home. And uh, the important with that action is not the emission cut you will do for the world. That will be hardly noticeable. But the important fact is what you do in, when you communicate it. Again, communication is a weaponizer for climate action. If I reduce my own emission with 20% and if I tell 10 people about how I did it and that it's actually something good, I save money and I live a better life and they will do it, it will create this wave of change and that is creating the exponential change. So, so everyone could, could be a wave creator uh, and that's very important to know. Everyone has the power to do something again against this crisis. I love it. I've got four more questions for you until we're until we're done. So the there there's one so during this time you've just uh, experienced all sorts of things and um, we don't have time is growing. I've seen it evolve and that. But you have a uh, Noah advisors come on board with Marco uh, Rodzinski neck and um, it's amazing how the momentum is now even it's, it's slowly starting but there's some other things i believe on the horizon and i was hoping maybe you could tease us some of the positive things we can expect to see from we don't have time some things you're working on some some positive uh, and investments and things that that probably give us some more hope on how the growth and what we're seeing in the future yeah, uh, actually, we had a really great start at uh, 2021. Uh, we had this founding round of uh, searching for new investors to help us build what, our platform. And uh, it was really concern about how we should succeed with that in the middle of the pandemic. Because when you talk to investors, it's all about uh, creating trust. And, and the, of course, it's easier to create trust if you are in the same room and if you know each other and you can see and look and talk to each other but that wasn't a possibility it's the only way for us to adapt uh, and uh, it has been a really really hard challenge to find investors uh, and this is something i tell you uh, because this is something i think that people looking from outside uh, outside to the we don't time organization thinks that we are 
uh, doing something that everyone loves to to invest in because what we do is really important. Uh, the case is that most investors, I've talked to thousand investors in three months. So I talked to a lot in, in all, all over the world. Uh, 950 says no, uh, because they are happy how the world works today. They don't see any reason why they should invest in something that uh, will play a huge role in our future society, because they don't see that the society will change. They are they are see what how the society works today, and 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 we don't have time platform is not for the society today. That we don't have time. We are building the society tomorrow. So an investor needs to know that they are actually part of not investing in a business idea that is tapping into a trend. They are investing in building a new way of economics, because we are going to build in this system where we're going to give credit to the ones that are doing the right thing and, and, and discredit to the ones that are doing the bad thing. Uh, and that is some, a platform that needs to exist. Uh, but we, we, are, we, have, we haven't built this yet. We are building it right now. Uh, so the ones, the 50 that have invested in us, who are they? I would say they are the dream investors that we really want on board because they are the ones that knows this, that knows that the world must change, that business as usual is not an alternative. So we have succeeded to have so many really, really important people with, with so much more resources and money to support us. Uh, and, and it's really, and, and we're not doing this for them. We're doing this together with them. And that's a different kind of approach. Uh, normally, an entrepreneur is pitching to an investor and saying that you're going to be rich, just trust me. My pitch is actually something similar to this. Don't you believe in yourself? What do you mean? Uh, I mean that you're someone that has great competence. If you join us, we will create change in the world together and you will help us succeed. And, I believe you believe in yourself because you have a great ego if you're a board leader. Uh, so that's the strategy behind the investors we have brought on board. And th that gives me a lot of confidence. Uh, but I will still say it's very, very frustrating that it's still 950 people turning an idea like this down because that means that they are turning a lot of other climate solutions down as well. They don't understand the urgency of the crisis. Uh, so we have a homework to do so that we next time we need more money we will have 50 people turning us down and 950 people saying yes but i think that's possible i absolutely think oh, that's definitely possible. definitely and if, if you go to if my listeners go to we don't have time.org they can see your list of partners you've done events with with ted uh, uh you've done events with the undp you've got different partnerships there as well as the Berlin School for Sustainable Futures is on there and many other uh, good collaborations and partnerships that you've had over the years. I, um, I expect we're going to see some great things coming from you for the COP26 and the COPs to come. And I, I cannot wait until um, we see more of that from you. I have, the, this is the hardest question I have for you, and it's really the burning question, WTF, which is not the square word, although we have been saying that it's, what's the future? And even more so, what, what do you see as a world that works for everyone? Uh, I see a world where, where we start to listen to each other and a world where everyone regardless of wherever you live or wherever you work for, uh, are, are helping each other. And um, I see a world where we have different values, actually. Uh, we, need to, we need to be much more a collective uh, uh, species. We, we can't have this race where you only focus on yourself and your individual action and, and your ego. We need to work together and in solidarity and um, uh, we need to think that if I can help four other people I'm doing something good that will make me happy more happy when I just help myself uh, but in a concrete way um, how we make that world happen 
I think we make that world happen by involving more people in the decisions. And in order to do that, we need to listen to people and uh, we need to make the communication as transparent as possible. Uh, but we also need some, some, some basic rules of how we're going to live on this planet. Uh, it's a hard question, uh, so I haven't prepared an answer, but one concrete answer I have is that in order to make that world happen, I think it's simple as this. We must make it rewarding and profitable to do something good for the humanity. And we must make it very, very, pro, very, very expensive to do something bad for the humanity and our environment. Uh, I think it's as simple as that. If you do something good for other people and for our nature, you should get awarded. And we will have all the system in place in order to succeed with that. We're good at creating systems that are rewarding actions. The problem is that we're rewarding bad action, as is. Yeah, not all, not all actions are good. I'll, I'll just keep it to two last questions, and they're really for my guests. Uh, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Very simple question. Uh, time. Uh, the, the most important uh, asset we all have, and everyone has the same, uh, is your time. What you do with your time will decide if you're part of the solution or part of the problem. Uh, what kind of work are you going to every single day? What are you doing on your free time? How are you spending your time on Earth? It's super important. The most important action lies in how you spend your time. Uh, and uh, it's so many people are reg regretting on how they did spend the time uh, when they are at the deathbed, etc. We know all that. So spend your time wisely, prioritize your relationship, prioritize uh, your well being, and prioritize of doing something good for the climate. If you do that, uh, you will you will be part of the solutions and you will have a much better life. Uh, but this is, of course, a, not an easy choice because uh, everyone can't choose freely on the kind of job they have or anything like that. I am fully aware of that. And that's why it's so important that we that have the freedom, uh, we have a responsibility to use our time very wisely, not for ourselves, but for all the rest that don't have the possibility to choose how they spend their time. Uh, I love it. And it ties really to it. We don't have time so that every, yeah. <laughs> every, every moment and every action is very important. Um, the, the last question is, what have you experienced or learned so far in your journey, your professional journey, that you would have loved to know from the start? Uh... That's a that's a different that's that's a difficult question. I will say um, the most important learning is so many. I would say, <laughs> but the most important learning is actually that uh, it's no. We think that uh, it's we have it's a lot of differences between nationalities and between cultures, etc. But humans are really like we are so similar. Uh, and what's different us is the values we have. Uh, so, so I think that values uh, is something that I now understand is, is super important. Uh, and it's really, really hard to change someone's values, but it's possible to do it, but it's, it's hard. And, and the only way to do it is actually to have patience. We, we can't go too fast because if we go too fast with having someone changing their values you will get you will you will get resistance and, and and you will not succeed so so i will say values uh, is my lordom uh, the importance of values and uh, patience is important and that's a problem for me because i'm not a patient person 
Well, thank you so much for your time, Ingmar. And that's all I have for you today. Is there anything that you would like to tell my listeners or you didn't get to mention or talk about today that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, one thing maybe. Um, go to Google Play and App Store on your phone. Search for We Don't Have Time or visit We Don't Have Time.org and sign up for, for the social network where you will find other people that want to solve the climate crisis and where you can work together. And if you do that, we will plant a tree uh, for everyone doing it. So that is something I will add. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. You have a wonderful day, Ingmar. It has been great. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.